Hi everyone. So I'm glad you got to see me messing around with all of the settings um, to get the screen working. Um, but what we're looking at today, so we're going to just do a quick review of shear center, uh, sorry, or shear flow in a closed section because you should be able to do that by now. And then we're going to move on to working out how do we determine shear center for a closed section. So the key difference that we said uh, when we had an open section. So for an open section, we said that our shear flow distribution, QS, is equal to minus BY on IXX, integral from S to zero, thickness multiplied by Y as a function of S, DS minus VX on IYY, integral from S to zero, thickness multiplied by X as a function of SDS. So this is the shear flow distribution in an open section, and we can use this because the value has to be zero at the start, okay, for an open section. And then what we did is we would start this if we have a section, for example, uh, like this, then our first ordinate S1 might be here. We would then have S2 down this way, and the starting value here, Q2 would be equal to QS1, where S1 is equal to, let's say, B, where B is just the width of this section. So we had these values that enabled us to work out the distribution, say, in this vertical member, because we were able to work, we knew what the value was at the beginning here. And then for an open section, we said that the moment caused by an applied shear load was equal to the moment due to shear flow if and only if that was that V was applied at the shear center. Okay, so this was for an open section. For a closed section, things were a little bit different. So for a closed section, we then changed the nomenclature slightly. We said that QS is equal to Q naught plus QB, and B stands for basic, or sometimes called the open shear flow. So basic or open shear flow, and then it's just the same as the one that we used previously. So it's just exactly the same as the open shear flow distribution. I'm just signing to my computer a second. So we went through an example, and what we, we went through an example for an, a closed section. And the way that we did that was, let's just think about physically what we did. So I'm going to draw this slightly differently to how we did it. So if we have, I'm drawing this with thickness in the members because I want to show this shear flow distribution. So if this is an open section we were looking at, we would then say, okay, we want to apply a shear load. Let's apply a known VY at a known position. And then we want to determine the shear flow distribution, for example, due to this applied load. So we would know that for a distribution like this, because of the rules that we've given ourselves, the internal shear flow has to be like this. So the two vertical sections have to have shear flow aligned with the shear force. That's so they can provide the same net shear force. And then for the continuous distribution, we have to have something like this. Okay, so the, this is what we know the shear flow distribution must be in a section like this. So the way that we solve the problem is we said, okay, so let's say this is what it must be like, and this is sort of a qualitative estimate of what it must look like. So then we said, okay, well, we'll, we'll define some ordinates So we write it on here and let's say S1, S2, S3, and S4. So these are then this, these new ordinates we defined, S1, S2, S3, and S4. So these are then shear flows going in this direction, okay? Just going continually in this clockwise direction on this object. And what we've effectively done 
I don't like using this nomenclature, but we are almost saying we've got a cut at this point here. And then we're pretending that the value here is some value that we're going to determine. Okay, so this is then the offset. So we'll say we have a Q naught here that we're going to determine. So the distribution QS1 would be Q naught plus QB1. So that would be equal to Q naught minus Vy on Ixx integral from S1 to zero thickness multiplied by Y as a function of S1 ds1. So we've done this, we've done an example for it. We go all the way through and what we would have done is we would have worked out these basic distributions and it would have looked something like this. So we would have had a distribution increasing, a linear increase, starting out at zero for my qb, going up and increasing. We then, this would have to be equal and we'd have a quadratic. We then see something that looks like this. Let's fill all of these in. And we then have a quadratic that looks like this. So these are then the basic distribution. This would be QB everywhere here. We then used for this problem where we had a known loading position, which was here. We said, okay, well, MV plus, sorry, MV has got to be equal to MQ. And then we solve for what Q naught has to be to make that the case. And what that physically means is that for this distribution here, well, let's just have a look. So we knew that this, this member has to have a distribution going downwards, but our numbering distribution, because it's clockwise, gives QS4 going upwards. So that means that it's got to change sign completely. So that means that the only way we can do that is to add on a, a big negative number to it. So Q naught was a big negative number. And what that sort of means, so let's put on here, let's do, let's draw this again actually, let's say, if I've got now, this just means that I've got Q naught is going in the other direction, that should be in the other direction, sorry. Q naught would then be going in this direction. Okay, that's the significance of it being negative. It's just a shear flow going in the other direction. So when we add these two together, we'd end up with a distribution that looks something closer to this. Okay, so and what we would have if we our total ordinates, or sorry, if, if S is defined in this direction, then we can see which parts would be effectively negative. The parts that would be negative because the flow has to go in the other direction would be in this place here. Okay, because the flow has to go left to right. So there's obviously a sign change here at which the value of QS equals zero, which is where we see this distribution looking like this. And also it would have to be negative in, let's just remind myself in this one here and in this bit here, okay? So these bits would be negative for this. And if you want to draw in them in a different color, that's how we would draw them. I don't particularly care for drawing these diagrams. They just help us visualize how these shear flow distributions work. What I, if I'm asking you to supply shear flow distributions, I'm asking you to produce, for example, this would be QB1 is equal to some number multiplied by S1. We can see this is just a linear distribution and you'd have to work out what that number is. And then once you've worked out what Q0 is, QS1 is equal to Q0 plus QB1. So you then have that number and it would add on to all of them. So you'd add Q0 onto QB1, you'd add Q0 onto QB2 to get QS2. So we, this, this would change its total value, it would actually go to the left really. But this is the physical significance of what we've done. So we went through a full example of this, produced the number, that's the one that I had to do twice because these, these are a pain to do. Um, 
but that's the physical significance of what we've done. So what we can do now, so we may now determine the shear flow distribution when we have a known loading position. So we may now determine the shear flow distributions when we have a known loading location um, for a closed section. We can't yet determine what the actual shear center is for a, for a closed section, and we don't know how to do that yet. We very clearly need some other relationship to actually help us do that. So let's bring in another relationship. So remember, for an open section, we use the equivalence of the moment due to the applied shear force and the moment due to the shear flows to find the shear center. So we need something else. So just from the basic definition of the shear center, we know that if we're loading at the shear center, we get no torsion, we get no twist. So there's an equation that we haven't developed, we haven't used yet, um, but I'm gonna introduce, which gives us the rate of twist for a closed section. So we'll use one of these lofty academic expressions, which is, it may be shown that the rate of twist per unit length the rate of twist, or torsion, depends what you want to call it, the rate of twist per unit length of a uniform closed section is, and let's write this down, d theta on dz is equal to minus 1 over 2 times the area of the cross section, and then it's the closed integral of qs on the shear modulus and the thickness ds. Okay, so let's highlight this, let's think about what all these terms mean. A, that's just the cross-sectional area. Let's draw a quick diagram to check we know what we're talking about here as well. Let's say if this was a uniform section. So this is a hollow section where, uh, let's test out my drawing skills by, there we go, that's good enough for me. So we've got a, the section itself would be this red outline. The Z would be the axis along here. Um, we would then have the torsion would be the rate of twist. So that's then, let's put this on here. Let's draw that slightly better. So then if the section was deformed, then we would have, I'm not even gonna attempt to draw a curved beam, but it would be, yeah, I'm not even going to attempt to draw a curve beam because I'll just do a terrible job. But we know that if we apply a shear force, what that is going to do is going to apply, it's going to change the value of QS, okay? Because it's going to change it, it's going to change these, and it's going to change the distribution of QS, and so then it's going to produce, it's going to change what's on the top of here or in the in the numerator of this closed contour integral. And so that's then gonna change the rate of twist depending on the amount of force we apply and where we apply it. So it 
follows that there is some value of this that gives us a zero value here or gives this whole thing equal to zero and if this whole thing is equal to zero then that means that we have no twist and if we have no twist then we must be loading at the shear center so let's just remind ourselves what a closed contour integral is this is let's say So if we have our section, say this was this section here, then looking at it like this, if we've got S1, S2, S3, and S4, then the integral ds would be equal to S1 plus S2 plus S3 plus S4. And let's just be rigorous. Let's say we've got height and base on here. Then S1 would be from B to zero, H to zero, B to zero, and H to zero. So it's a complete integral all the way along DS here. Okay, so we're gonna use this to help us determine the shear center because As we change, let's go back over here a second. So, as we determine and we solve this, we found that actually that, that offset value doesn't change with, say, horizontal loading position. So let's say if we have this problem here, and let's say this was the example we did where we, this might be a, not quite the same as the example we did, but let's say we've got 2t, 1t, 2t, and 2t. Because this body is vertically symmetric, we know that the line of symmetry is through here. So the shear center has to be somewhere on this line. So we would pick an arbitrary point along here to apply a VY and then that we then solve to determine the whole we work out what the the shear flows were and we then would look to determine what the offset is so we can get the offset from this equation we're going to figure that out okay because the actual offset doesn't matter where this loading position is because let's just go here um, I need to do a little bit more development to this to make it to make it worthwhile so let's go through this I'm sort of jumping around a little bit apologies guys so it follows that if we are loading at the shear center this equation is equal to zero That is, there is no twist. And so that means that we can determine the value of Q naught based upon this equation up here. So we're going to take this equation, we're going to manipulate it a little bit. So let's say d theta on dz is equal to zero, which means is equal to minus one over two a. So what I've got up there, integral of qs on gt ds so qs is equal to q naught plus qb so if we're loading at the shear center then we know what qb is we don't know what q naught is so we may determine and you guys should be capable of determining this 
And this is the bit that we don't know yet. Okay, we managed to solve it when we knew what the loading position was. But if we don't know what the loading position was, then we've got no equation, or we didn't have an equation to work out what Q0 is. So we're going to use this equation here. So let's say, uh, let's get rid of the 1 on 2a, because if the whole thing is equal to 0, then we'll say that 0 is equal to closed contour integral of Q0 plus QB on GT dS. So we can then rearrange this whole equation to solve for Q0, which is the bit that we want to know. Q0 is equal to minus the integral, or the closed contour integral, of QB on GT dS, and then that's equal to, one, sorry, over, 1 over GT ds. So this then means that this gives us the value of the offset at the shear center. Okay. Well, in fact, it just gives us the value of the offset due to any vy that we apply. We can then use this because qb is just going to be a function of vy and then the thicknesses in the object itself. This will give us the offset that we have in the section. Um, just remembering in here, we've got g is the shear modulus, t is thickness. So if we have we can simplify this expression a little bit. If we've got an object with constant shear modulus, which if I don't tell you the shear modulus, you can assume this then simplifies to Q0 is equal to minus closed contour integral, QB on T dS over closed contour integral of one over T dS. And that's if G is constant. And if G and T are constant, then Q0 is equal to the clo minus closed contour integral of QB dS over closed contour integral of dS, okay, if T is also constant. So what does this give us? Once we've got this, we've then determined the value of the offset due to a particular shear loading. And once we've got that, we then know that for a given shear loading, that's going to be the value of the offset we've got. We can then vary the position or vary the location or, or rather just solve for the location that makes the moment due to the shear load equal to the moment due to the shear flows. Let me just pause here one. Right, I'm back again, guys. So just um, while I stop for, I realize there's a mistake up here. Okay, so this should not have a negative sign here. Okay, it shouldn't have a negative sign there. Let's just get rid of that. And everything else that follows is okay. Okay, so using these equations here, whichever one we end up using, we then determine the value that the offset must have when we're loading at the shear center. And once we've got that, we can then use this equation to determine where that loading must be occurring. And that then gives us the shear center. So then 
Remember the MV, this is just the applied shear load multiplied by the moment arm to wherever we're looking at, where, so wherever we're evaluating moments. And then this is the moment due to the shear, um, to the shear flows. So we're going to go through this and we're, I'm going to solve first off, well in fact what I'm going to solve is we're going to set a problem up like this. Let's say we've got a square or a, no, let's, let's, well let's say it's a rectangle section. Okay so these are walls with thicknesses Let's say this is S1, S2, S3, and S4. So we've got this problem here, um, and let's call this T1, T2, T3, and T4. And we're gonna, I'm going to impose that when I solve this problem, T1 is going to be equal to T3 which makes this problem vertically symmetric. And then that means that my line of, my poorly drawn line of symmetry down the center means that the shear center is gonna be somewhere on this line for this problem. So we need to apply a VY at some distance across here. And let's call this distance, um, let's just call it R because I'm terrible at drawing zeta. And if we give this problem, let's say this is the base, is the total width of this shape, and the height is the height. And these heights, these are defined to the centroid. So I could just use these values here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna solve this using Python rather than doing it by hand, but we're gonna use symbolic, the symbolic toolbox in Python. And what I'd like to show is that if T4 and T2 are equal, we know this is fully symmetric. So if that's the case, what we want to find, if T2 is equal to T4, then we should find that R is equal to B on two. So that's what we should be able to solve with this problem. And if we can show this, you should then be able to modify that to determine where the shear center is of that numerical example that we did. And I want you to do that, repeat it, and do it on Slack. So let's switch over to a bit of Python. Let's move this up here. And now let's make that a little bit smaller. There we go. So I've got a new Jupyter notebook going. Um, I've got this white on dark thing going. And I'm gonna sort of talk through how I use the symbolic toolbox to do some of the algebra for me and do some of the, the integrals. So let's say um, import some toolboxes. Let's say import SymPy as SP. Now that enables me to use symbols and to do some sort of integral expressions. So we've got uh, four shear flows I need to determine. I need to determine sh shear flows due to S1, S2, S3, and S4. So let's introduce those S's as symbols. So I'll say S1, S2, S3, and S4 are SymPy.symbols. S1, S2, S3, and S4. And that just means I can use those as symbols in this, in this exercise. Um, I'm gonna say the base and the height are SymPy symbols. So those, those, that's good, I've got those. And the thicknesses, let's put T1, T2, T3, and T4 as well. T1, T2, T3, and T4 are symbols. Guys, also you don't have to use a computer to solve this for you. You guys are all competent enough um, mathematicians to solve this. I'm just showing you different means you can check your work. If I'm doing a problem like this, I will often do some of the analytical um, mathematics using Python instead, because it means I can change something up here and see the answer change down here. Okay, so I've got those in here now. What else do I need? So those are all my sort of input symbols, I think. Um, Let's give this a go. So 
let's say we are solving this problem here, so I'm going to solve uh, initially, I want to determine the basic shear flow distributions. So those would have been the QBs. So that's imagining that this is open here and continuing round. So, um, oh, I need a symbol for VY as well. VY is a simpy dot symbol, VY. And in fact, let's, I'm gonna need IXX as well. So let's say, no, I can just determine what IXX is for this problem. That's the very first thing we need to do. So let's go up here. Let's say determine the second moment of area. So each of these has a base and a height and an area. So let's say, um, um, areas. So first we've got to determine the areas. So I need to know the dimensions of each of these shapes. So we'll say um, bases. This is going to be a list of the four bases of each of these. So it needs to be B, which is the base of the vertical member. The base of this member is just the thickness. That's going to be T2. Base of this member is going to be B. Base of this member is going to be T4. So let's say I've got B, T2, B, T4. Okay. Heights is equal to, now the heights of each of these, I'm going to have T1, H, T3, and H. Uh, T1, H, T3, and H. Okay, so that's got the bases and heights of all of those different parts now. Now, I'm going to determine the areas of them. So the area is just going to be the bases multiplied by the heights of each of these. So let's say areas equals areas. I'll do a list comprehension. Check that produces the areas, yeah. Okay, so we see that because these are all symbols, it's just correctly said the first one has got the base times thickness two, Second one is the height times, sorry, first one is the base times the height one times thickness one. The second one has got the height of the whole object multiplied by thickness two. The second one has got the base, which is the width of this whole thing up here, multiplied by thickness three. The third one has got the height, which is this whole thing, multiplied by thickness four. So those are the areas of each of those. And then I'm going to determine their second moments of area. So because this upper and lower one, are, have got thin thicknesses and that these would be base multiplied by thickness cubed and those are all small we're gonna the only contribution to second moment of area from these is a multiplied by their y displacement from the centroid squared okay so let's say um, individual ixx's let's say ixx1 I'm going to do these individually because I know I can do these list comprehensions sort of without thinking about it, but I know it's hard to sometimes follow them. So we'll say ixx1, the only part of that, because b multiplied by t cubed is so small, is going to be areas 1, so it's the first area multiplied by its y displacement from the centroid. So its y displacement is going to be up here to here, so it'll be b on 2 divided by sorry, b on 2 squared, sorry. So let's say b divided by 2 squared. ixx2 is going to be the, be the base of this one. So let's say this is bases 1 multiplied by heights 1 power 3 divided by 12. Okay, ixx2, ixx3 is the bottom one. It's going to just going to be the same as this one up here, so I can just say that's equal to ixx1, and then ixx4 is equal to ixx2. I didn't even necessarily need to do that. I could have just said the total ixx is equal to this doubled plus this doubled, but I'll just say ixx is equal to ixx1 plus ixx2, ixx3 
plus ixx4. Ready print. Okay, so we've got the total moment of area, and we see it's, yeah, let's see if we can simplify this. I don't, I don't think that expression could be simplified any further, but let's just try. I can do ixx.simplify. Yeah, it doesn't change it at all. This isn't a particularly nice way of printing it, sort of down here, so we can try, we can try something else. I can use simpy's pretty print. Let's do sp.pprint, which stands for pretty print, ixx. Here we go. So it's tried to make this look a little bit nicer. It's still not that great, but we can see it's B cubed T one on two. That's actually, that's, that looks terrible. That's done a really bad job of printing that. So I'm not going to use that. There we go. That's sort of clearer there. So it's base cubed multiplied by thickness one on two plus height cubed plus thickness two on six. And let's just check everything in here is right. So that's ixx1 is areas, yep, b on 2 is, sorry, that should not be b on 2, it should be h on 2. That's my mistake there, because that's the, this height here is h on 2. So that's, let's check that. There we go. That looks better to me. Okay. And let's just check these. That's basis 1. Let's check all of these are correct. Basis b, t2, b, t4, t1, h. Yep, that looks right to me. Okay, so I've now got the total second moment of area for this one. I can look at the shear flow distribution. So let's do Q at QB1. So we're looking at what's going along here. Okay, so QB1, and let's just remember that the expression we're trying to use, QB1 is equal to minus Vy on Ixx, and then we do the integral from S1 to zero thickness multiplied by y as a function of s1, ds1. So y as a function of s1 along here is just a constant. So let's write that down first. y s1 is going to be equal to a constant, which is height on 2. Um, yeah, h on 2, which is correct. OK, so I've got that. Let's. Uh, and I need to do everything else in this expression now. So QB1 is equal to minus VY, which is just a, we've got this in here, we've already got a symbol for it, divided by IXX, which is just now an analytical expression we've already got, multiplied by SP.integrate. And we're now doing the integral. And I want to do the integral, and it's going to be in those limits shouldn't be in there. Actually, no, those limits are in there, but that's fine. I'm, I'm going to leave this as an indef indefinite integral. So I need to have thickness 1, which have I got already? Yeah, it's just a symbol. Thickness 1 multiplied by ys1. I need to do that with respect to s1. And let's see if that gives me something good. Doesn't like that because vy is not defined. That's strange, if I not run this, let's run this up here. vy is not defined. I thought I've got this up here, vy is a symbol. That's confusing. Let's... Oh, it's because I've used sp.symbol, it should be sp.symbols. There we go. Let's run this again. There we go. So now this has given me the expression, which would have been a real nightmare to sort of solve analytically using all of these, not having numbers for base and height, but using now using a computer to do some of the actual calculus for us, we're able to solve this sort of easily. Let's see if we can simplify this. QB1 is, is a symbolic object. I can do dot simplify. There we go, somewhat tidier. Let's see if we can get this to pretty print, sp.preprint. Okay, so this here is now, let's do print, print the basic shear flow. To, 
Okay, it's got the basic shear flow distribution, QB1 is, and we've got this now. So it's a function of VY, and everything on the denominator of here is related to IXX, because we've got IXX up here. So is that... Yeah, and also because it's, it's, it's done a lot of the simplification for us because I've asked it to do the simplify. So we've got now, this is our QB1 here, and that's good. So we now need to know the principal value here, okay, because that tells us what to start S2 with. So we're going to work out the principal value. That's right here, this is QB1. Principal value is Q2 is equal to QB1 dot sub, I think, it's dot, I think it's dot sub, so let's have a look, help sp dot subs, is it sp dot subs? Nope, is it substitute? I can't remember how I do this, let me just hold fire one second and remember how. How did I do this earlier? I'm going to go back to my, because I've obviously done this example earlier. It's, uh, what did I do? Oh, it is dot subs. So, uh, okay, uh, let's try this. Just, I think, so if you use dot subs, you can substitute a symbolic value with a real value. So let's say um, a is equal to vy multiplied by 2 down here. So I'm just trying this out. Okay, let's do print a. Okay, I could do print a dot subs, and I'm going to substitute, um, and then you put the value, and then you put what you want to substitute it with. So we're going to substitute vy with 1,000. Okay, and so that then prints A, which is equal to 2 times VY, where with VY substitute for 1,000 gives me 2,000. Okay, so I can now do the same thing up here, but I'm going to substitute the value for S1 being B. So I want to work out the value here, so I've got QB1. I'm going to replace S1 with B, and that's going to give me the principal value at the end. Okay, so now if I do this, this then gives me the principal value at the end here. And again, we don't need to always print these out. It's just a good idea to see and check you haven't made a mistake as we're going along. on F string, that's why that didn't work. Let's put an F in there. There we go. So we've now got the principal value there, which means that's the value that we must start this next distribution with. So because we are coding, I can just copy this line down and do Q2. Okay, if I was being a smarter coder, I'd think about maybe doing this in a loop, but it's often easier when we're demonstrating examples to just go through step by step, and you guys can think about some better ways of doing this perhaps. So we'll do QB2, it's going to be equal to QB2 is equal to Q2, which is the principal value, plus the same expression that we had before. Okay, so it's going to be VY on AXX, and then we're going to integrate, and we're just going to replace these values. Thickness 2 multiplied by YS2 as a function of S2. Sorry, integrated with respect to S2. So if I run this, it won't like it because it doesn't know yet what what ys2 is, okay? ys2 is not defined what ys2 is going to be. It's the, for this member here, it is y as a function of s2. So it's going to be b on two minus s2, okay? Because that then takes us from here all the way down to here. So let's put this here. ys2 is equal to b on two minus S2, and if I run this, I've now got my next basic shear flow distribution. We can just print this out again if we wished. Let's do this here. Copy those lines, paste them down here. The basic shear flow distribution QB2 
I've now got this and it's, it's not doing a very good job of, of printing these out nicely. So I'm not going to pretty print this. Let's just print this. Okay, so we've got this dirty gray expression. As long as we can see that it sort of makes sense. If you were doing this for real or the first time, you check that these sort of make sense with what you're doing. But I'm confident that I know how to use SymPy and go through and do this stuff. Again, you can just do this by hand if you want. I'm just trying to teach you guys different means of doing things, okay? And you know I love Python. Next thing, we work out the principal value. So how did I do it before? Let's just copy these down. Principal values, this was Q2. This principal value is Q3. So Q3 is going to be take QB1 and substitute S2 for H, okay? I can see I've made a mistake. Some of you might have seen I made a mistake. YS2 is not this. This height, this should be H on two, not S on two. But because I'm coding, I can just change it, run it again, and everything's changed, okay? If I'd done that writing out and made a mistake in my actual calculus, doing it by hand, that would have been a real pain. So let's change these down here. Here we go, so we've now got the principal value at the next one. Okay, so we've got shear flow distribution QB1, and then same here, we've got QB2, and we've got the last principal value. So we're just gonna do the exact same thing now. I'm gonna copy all of these lines, and we're gonna work out QB3, which is distribution along here. So QB3, I need to know what Y S3, Y is a function of S3, going to be a constant and that constant is minus h on 2. Okay, qb3 starts with the principal value of q3 and then it's going to be the same on here, minus vy on ixx, we need the thickness of 3, we need y as a function of s3 and it needs to be integrated with respect to s3, so we change that there. The basic shear flow distribution qb3, I'm going to change that. Is going to be equal to the thing that we've just determined, QB3 printing here, which it's got from up here. And then we work out the principal value at the end, QB4. So that's going to be Q4 is QB3 substitute with S3 is equal to base. So the principal value Q4 is equal to Q4.simplify. Here we go. Okay, so we're getting things that look like expressions coming out now. Let's just go through and just check these sort of make sense to us as well. So QB1, I should have mentioned this earlier, QB1 is linear in S1. QB2 is quadratic in S2, which we can see because we've got S2 here multiplied by S2, it's quadratic. QB3 is linear in S3, which is what we want to see, which is good. And QB4 has this principal value, which we're going to see if it's correct in a moment. Let's just check I've not made a mistake here. I think we're good. Okay. So we've got that principal value, and now we can finally work out the QB4, which is this last distribution going vertically. YS4 is going to be minus H on 2 plus S4. QB4 is equal to the principal value Q4 plus the integral of the thickness 4 multiplied by YS4, which we've just determined, integrated with respect to S4, which gives us the basic distribution QS4, which is then printed as we simplify it. And we're going to put Q5, which is not a node that we've determined, but it's going to be the value up here. Okay, and we should expect this to come back to zero. So Q4 substitute Q S4 with B. Oh, I can see why these weren't working because I've done the wrong thing here. Okay, these should be where I've been substituting values and to work out the principal value. I'm not substituting S1 in there. Uh, oh no, no, sorry, these are right. It's me being stupid. Forget that I said I point something out. There we go. So now what we want to do to work out this principal value Q5, which should be the same as Q1, or which it, what its principal value is here, which has to be zero, then we're putting this in. And let's check if this runs. That doesn't work. Let's have a look. Let's 
let's just check. So I would expect this to give me a value of zero down here. So there's some prob there's some problem with my code. So let's go through and have a look. Okay, so yS1 is equal to height on two. That's that's this value here. Okay, y is function of s1 is correct. Vy it's going to be the integral of thickness multiplied by yS1 with respect to s1. That's fine. And then principal value QB2 is substituting into here the value of S1 equals B, so that's correct. Okay, YS2 is equal to height on 2 minus S2, which is correct. So then that starts with the principal value of Q2 minus the integral of thickness of the second one multiplied by YS2, which is correct, Multi uh, as integrated with respect to S2, so that's correct. Here now, the principal value Q3 is substituting into QB2, which is what we've just determined. The value of S2 equals H, which is when it's gone S2 from 0 to H here. And that's fine. QB3, yep, Y is constant at minus H on 2. So that then gives me QB3 is equal to this principal value, which we've determined, minus Vx on the integral of thickness of 3 multiplied by YS3 integrated with respect to S3 which gives me the principal value here. If I take this expression and substitute B into it, yep, that's fine. Okay, and then YS4 is minus H on 2. It starts here when S4 is equal to 0, minus H on 2, plus S4 all the way up to H on 2. That's correct. So QB4 is going to be equal to the principal value here, mod minus VY on IXX, which is correct. And then we integrate the thickness of 4 multiplied by YS4, with respect to S4. Okay, so that seems to be coming up as okay. Now, I wonder if this cancels at all. I'm just confused as to why this is not coming up with zero. One second, so let me just pause. I'm just gonna look at the code that I did earlier and see if I can spot. Okay, so I'm back, I'm back and I figured some things out. So there was one issue here was that some of you might have seen, I had a B here rather than an H. Um, Q5 is going to be, let's bring this diagram back, uh, Q5 is going to be the value up here. So I needed to say that's going to be the value on QB4 when S4 is equal to H, not B. Didn't solve it though, so if I change that, I still run this, I still get quite a, n a nasty analytical expression here. I would expect this to be equal to zero. And because we've solved problems like this before as well, because this, if this is truly symmetric, then because it has to equal zero here, it also has to equal zero here. So I would expect Q4 to be zero. And I've still got some nasty analytical expressions coming. And it's because I haven't actually told this problem it's symmetric. I've just put these thicknesses, thicknesses in as placeholders. So I'm gonna change the way I've done this slightly. So let's say thickness, which is a new variable T. T is equal to sp.symbols T. Okay, so I've got that here. And let's change my thicknesses. So let's say this, is equal to, let's change this slightly. Let's make it symmetric. So this is t, this can be 2t, this can be t, and this can be 2t. So this is still symmetric. So we should expect the value of the shear center to be here, in the, sorry, the shear center to be zero. Sorry, we should expect the whole, since the whole thing's symmetric, we should expect the shear center to be in the middle. Okay, but I'm gonna say that T1 is equal to T, which is what I said, T2 is equal to two times T, T3 is equal to T, and T4 is equal to two times T. So that's just constrained the symmetry into this problem. And if I run this, these lower cells again now, we end up with Q4 is equal to zero, and Q5 is equal to zero, which says that this is symmetric. So we've now found these distributions. We've got a linear here, we've got a quadratic here, we've got a linear here going back to zero, and then we've got a quadratic that's symmetric around about, so it's zero at both sides. That's because of the vertical symmetry. I could still have a horizontal asymmetry. So let's put three T in here, run this again. I would still end up with these two being zero. And it's that vertical symmetry because these two with the same thickness have to have the same shear flow distribution that's what makes that go back to zero. So I'm going to go back up here and I'm just going to change this to be, yes, we'll make this whole thing symmetric. We'll say we've got, the whole thing is completely symmetric, but it's just 
it's 2t here, 2t here, t and t. And that was why these expressions weren't simplifying. Again, I'm doing this all analytically. You guys can do this numerically if you wish, just putting numbers in. This is just a good way of showing things. And what we're trying to do here is we want to show that if we do it using these analytical methods, we can show that the shear center is equal to zero here. So now, now that we've got all of these shear flows, we've got all of the basic shear flows, we can then do the expression that's going to give us Q naught. Q naught is equal to minus the closed contour integral of QB divided by T divided by the closed contour integral of 1 over T. These are both with respect to DS. So we can determine these separately. I just determine them as a numerator and a denominator. And this is going to give us the value of the offset. Okay, so I'm going to say my numerator is equal to, before this, let's just remember that for our closed contour integral, for us, integral ds is equal to the integral from base to zero, ds1, plus height to zero, ds2, plus base to zero, ds3 plus height to zero ds4 so we're just going to do this and i can then just do this i can, you could either use this like trapezoidal numerical integration or we can use simpy to do a definite integral that's what i'm going to say my numerator is equal to let's do ds1 first so let's do that's the integral of because remember we're what we're actually trying to write now in, in this numerator is this expression here so I want to do the closed contour integral of QB on T DS. So that's going to be equal to the closed contour integral of QB1 on T DS1 from B to zero and so on. So I need to do this plus QB2 on T2 DS2 and so on. So I'm going to put this in. Okay, so that's going to be SP dot integrate qb1 divided by t1 and then because we're doing a definite definite integral we still just supply the thing that we're integrating to but we say i'm integrating from s1 from 0 to b okay and i'm gonna continue this line down there so i can just do because i need to do this four times basically so i'm going to do this And then I can just replace each of these. This is, guys, why I want to show you. Sometimes it's easier to do calculus and algebra using something like Python. Okay, so the second, I've just changed all the variables of integration and all the functions we're integrating and all the thicknesses. I need to just change the limits now. So the first one, we were integrating QS2 from, S, sorry, QS1 from, 0 to b. Sometimes when I say integrals, I say integrating from the end to the start, and that's bad practice. I shouldn't say that. Okay, we're integrating from 0 to b. With this next one, we're integrating s2 from 0 to h. Here, we're then integrating s3, or qs, to qb3 rather, from s3 is 0 to b, which is correct, and then this one's just to h here. Let's see if that works. There we go. We've got a big expression, which is the numerator of my expression. Let's do the same with the denominator. The denominator is going to be just the same. I can just copy all of this out and replace these with ones. Because I need to do the integral of the thicknesses. And then I want Q0 is equal to minus my numerator divided by the denominator. And I can then print this. So let's do print the offset. Q0 when loading at the shear center is. I'm going to simplify it. Okay, so I've got this expression here. Now we can see that the offset is a function of what we're loading with, which makes sense. And then it's just a function of the geometry of the problem. So it's B and H on here. Okay, so that's the value of the offset that we've got now. We've got an expression in. If we knew what the height was, we knew what the base was. 
and we knew what the lo well vy is arbitrary we, we don't need to know what vy is we then have the offset value so now that we've got this we can then say okay my we said this was excuse me r let's say this is my vy in this case let's choose to evaluate moments here we're going to evaluate moments at this point so we need to know the we don't need to care about what happens q s1 and QS4 because those can't provide a moment here. So we need to know these two here. So MV is equal to BY multiplied by R. MQ is equal to the integral of QS2 from H to zero multiplied by this moment arm here. So that's going to be the base multiplied by the force due to QS2. Let's move up so that's a little bit easier to see. And then plus, we need to do the force due to this shear force as well. That's H multiplied by the integral from B to zero, QS3. Should put some variables of integration into each of these. Okay, so this now is my moment due to the shear flow. And because they've got to be equal, then R is equal to MQ divided by VY. Okay, and this is going to give us the location of the shear center. And what we are expecting when this object is symmetric, we're expecting this to be at B on 2. So what we need to calculate is we need to calculate MQ, and we've just chosen for our purposes to evaluate them up here. So let's put these expressions in. Let's do this down here. Determine shear center by evaluating moments at the upper left-hand corner. Now we've got this Q0. What I need to do is add it to those QBs to get my QSs. So first step is get the actual shear flow distributions. And that's easy. I can just say QS1 is equal to QB1 plus Q0. So we're not actually going to use QS1 and QS2, but we'll work them out anyway. So I've got now all of my actual shear flow distributions. I've just added those offsets on. And then I can work out what MQ is. Let's uh, move that up. So what I need to do is, now let's check here. So I'm gonna put this first bit, MQ is equal to B multiplied by the integral, SP dot integrate. And I'm gonna do QS2. And I'm integrating from, the variable is S2 going from zero to H plus. Next one is the height multiply by sp dot integrate and then I'm doing let's put a thing in here so I don't have a horizontal line I want to then do qs3 and I want to integrate the variables s3 from 0 to b okay so that gives me my mq I'm not even going to bother looking at what the value is because I then want to just say that r is equal to Because if you're doing this on paper, you'd work out what that is, you'd divide it by a number, but I can just say that R is equal to MQ divided by VY, print the shear center is at R dot simplify. I don't even think I need to simplify because I think it's gonna work out R pretty easily. Uh, I don't like that bugger. Let's do R dot simplify. Bingo. Okay, shear center is at B on two, and it is at B on two because I was a bit silly there. Um, these shear flows are going to give me a clockwise moment. As I've defined it, this gives me a negative moment. That's my mistake there. Okay, so that's my mistake in that uh, if I'm defining moments positively, 
I should have had a negative sign here. So I can correct that in here. Go make that negative in this line here. The go through the shear center is at B on two. That's amazing guys. We've just done this. So we, we said at the start, if I have a completely symmetric object, so it's got two lines of symmetry, and we knew this right back at the beginning, the centroid has to be the shear center location. So if it's completely symmetric, it's pretty easy to determine where the centroid is. So because we said, well, this is 2t, this is 2t, and these were t, we then just solve this completely analytically using Python that has to be equal to halfway along the base. Now that's amazing. Okay, that's a really powerful procedure we've just done. Um, we can go back up to the top. I can say, let's. what if it's not symmetric? What if the thickness on the left-hand side, this one here, T4 is 3T? Run this, run this. Oi, pretty nasty long expression here. Um, but that's because it's then going to be a function of the base times height ratio here. So let's just say, um, if, I, if I'd done this, we could then just substitute in here. I could just say, let's say, for example, I've got an object that is one meter base times one meter height with a thickness of three, one, two, one, which is what I've just done. I've changed all those thicknesses. I could do r dot subs, and I could put these in as, I think I could put them in as a list. I think, let's try this out. I want to substitute base for one and height for one. Let's try that. Doesn't like that. So I can't remember the sub the lingo for this. So let's just do a quick Google. Let's say SymPy substitute. I obviously had to look this up yesterday. Basic operation, SymPy substitute. There's a way of substituting more than one thing in here and it's here. There we go. So you input them in as a list of tuples like this, okay? So I'm gonna just go through and just, what I tried to do, I tried to put them in as a list of, there we go, that doesn't, that doesn't make, I tried to put them in as a list of strings. So what I'm gonna do is go here, I want to replace B with one and H with one. And now if I run this, there we go, okay? This then tells me that my shear center is slightly further to the right, okay? Because it is 79 on 170, which is slightly over one half. Okay, is that right? No, it's less than one half, isn't it? No, it's over one half, that's fine. This is where I tell you guys, my numeracy sometimes is shocking. It's less than one half, isn't it? Um, I'm very good at doing mathematics when it doesn't have numbers in it when it has numbers in my like that fraction i couldn't even think about for a second obviously 80 doubled is yeah 160 okay that's fine i'm being stupid here okay that's cool okay so we've done let's just uh if you want to evaluate things as well if you if you're struggling like me to deal with fractions and it's a long Sunday afternoon and you spent yesterday watching your team get hammered at Six Nations. Then we can also simplify, we can also do something called eval f, which express things as integers, sorry, as numbers. So I can do eval f and I can see now clearly, because I couldn't do that fraction in my head, 0.46. Okay, so that is some halfway, just less than halfway along here, which is what we expect. Let's just say here we, with this example, I change this to 3t, 2t, 1t, and 1t. And what I then found that my shear center moved from 50% to 46%. It moved closer towards the side that made it thicker, okay? Which is what we would expect. We'd expect it, the shear center to move closer towards that mass that, or that area that we just added to the, to the section effectively. Real embarrassing numeracy fail numeracy fail there, um, but I mean it guys, my basic adding up and number skills are pretty poor, but my ability to do mathematics is pretty good. So those are two distinct skills quite a lot of the time. So what I've done here, this code here, everything in this code book, you can take, copy through, 
um, you know, you've got to go through and actually work out how to do it yourself. You've got to write down each command as I'm doing it. But what I would like you guys to do is for the numerical example we did, which I think had a had different widths in millimeters and the shear force of Vy applied, for that object, assuming it's got a constant uh, shear modulus, work out where its shear center is and post it on Slack. Okay, I want to see an example. I don't care about seeing your code. I just want to see the number. I want you to tell me what the number is and put it on there. Okay, so gone through this, just showing you guys how to do different methodologies, how to use maybe computational methods to do a numerical solution, um, or to, sorry, to do an analytic solution, and then we can just substitute values in to give us a an actual numerical answer to a problem. So hopefully that's been interesting. You now know how to determine shear center for a closed section in addition to shear center for an open section. And I'm gonna record a bunch more examples um, to be released over the next couple of days and we will be done with this module. And then you're gonna get your own aircraft wing box problem that you've got to determine where the shear center is. Okay, guys, it's been fun going through this stuff of sorts. I will see you all in hopefully in the review on Wednesday. Hope you all have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you later.